me the selfish ape. Soon you'll know why. I'm the primate we all unknowingly carry inside. I belong to the most successful tribe that ever existed. But I'm desperate. Something has gone wrong. I'm going to show you how I got to this point. It all started many, many years ago. This is the oldest story in the world. The war that made not only us primates what we are, but all the other animals as well. Our lineage evolved out there, in a dangerous world in which only the winners are capable of surviving. Some families acquired fangs. Others procured amazing adaptations that enabled them to prosper in the most inhospitable places on the planet. These fierce clashes made us learn. They shaped us in the only law we have become the true masters of. To compete, to eat, to destroy. From a cast of vegetarian primates, we had to learn to kill, and thus we became carnivores. But our tree-dwelling past shaped us forever. Everything was going well. Our species extended throughout the entire planet like an oil slick. The great African plains taught us the importance of an efficient brain with which we could hunt the most colossal creatures and eat them. Plain dwellers lived in immense herds that provided us an abundance of meat. We finished almost all of them off. Today, only one of the large ones is left, the only giant we've allowed to live. The African elephant is a vegetable-eating machine that can radically change the landscape it inhabits. It is the mega herbivore, a 21-kilogram heart at the service of a trunk. This, the greatest devourer of plants on the planet, is not the only one capable of irreversibly altering its environment. There is an ape whose capacity to multiply can be qualified as plague-like. The selfish ape. Human beings are not foreign to this race that lasts millions of years. As animals, we are very much a part of it. We belong to the ancient lineage of primates. Our family began with animals similar to these, primitive insect eaters, small and insignificant nocturnal creatures that scurried to the haven of forests dominated by giant reptiles. Little by little, these big-eyed shy beings expanded their diet and solved the digestive problems brought on by consuming plants. Our ancestors discovered that fruit and leaves were abundant 
In order to exploit this new resource, evolution provided them with everything they needed. Their vision improved to find ripe fruit. Their eyes moved to the front of their face, and their hands evolved to grab and rip with precision. With this new binocular vision in color, their appendages fit for manipulation, and their ever-increasing brain size, they slowly dominated the three-dimensional world of trees. Between 25 and 35 million years ago, these animals began to evolve into true monkeys. Their tails became longer and more flexible. Instead of running and jumping, they began to use their arms, swinging and grabbing on with their hands. They would later lose their tails, and their greater size allowed them to feel more secure when they sporadically ventured onto the ground. We are the descendants of apes of the forest, a relatively pleasant ecosystem replete with food. Up there, they were safe from the butchers of the ground, armed with claws and enormous teeth with which we cannot compete. But something happened. Some 15 million years ago, because of a global climatic upheaval, forests became smaller. Ancestral monkeys were then faced with a dilemma. They either hung on to what was left of their old wooded homes, or they would be forced out into the dangerous savannas. We were literally expelled from paradise from our fruit-filled garden. The ancestors of the large primates of today decided to stay. It was a bad decision because things have not gone well for them since then. The descendants of those who fled are us. All this history is heavily imprinted in our genes, much more than we are willing to admit. The strangest animal on the planet is on its way. But a diet of fruits and nuts that had sustained us in the forests could be readapted to one of roots and bulbs from the ground. Instead of lazily stretching an arm to grab the ripe fruit from a branch, as we had done in paradise, down here, we had to scratch and dig the hard earth with much effort, just as these bushmen from Namibia do today. The savanna is a more hostile habitat than the forests. We complemented this costly diet with small animals from the ground that were easy to capture. Each insect was a treat, each egg or invalid chick a gift. This larger intake in proteins rendered large belly sizes to digest heavy leaves unnecessary. An increase in brain size came at the expense of a reduction of the digestive system. Thus fibrous plants that were difficult to assimilate gave way to meat and animal fat.
We thus arrive at the last million years of our story and to a series of increasingly dramatic events that have made us who we are today. Though they lacked claws and fangs, ancestral apes had a large brain, good eyesight, and prehensile and efficient hands inherited after millions of years of eating fruit. And also, as with all good primates, a certain degree of social organization. Then we became addicted to animal protein, and we began to hunt more and hunt better, thus increasing our intellectual development. Only by observing our origin and studying the biological aspects of the way in which we currently behave as a species can we understand our extraordinary existence. We became organized primates who hunted. This makes us unique among all existing apes. The bad thing is that a change like this produced an animal with a dual personality. Too little time has gone by for us to forget our old vegetarian ways while we hurriedly assume the new ways of carnivores. Our body and lifestyle were designed for a forest and quite suddenly, in evolutionary terms, we were expelled into a world in which we could only survive as intelligent predators. This has affected our behavior until today, and there is no suit and tie or technology that can hide this. That's how it was. Every part of this body, all of our abilities and behaviors, are a product of evolution. These eyes that can see in color, these hands that are capable of shooting, and this brain that is wont to doubt it all. We became so strong that we were able to invade the entire planet by following large migrant animals to rob them of their meat. It didn't matter where they went, in the heat or in the cold. There we were, ready to finish them off. There is an evolutionary theory that suggests that the first hominids, after becoming addicted to the meat of these animals, followed them in their migrations. And this is how we left Africa and colonized the world. But the planet is no longer what it once was. The selfish ape is everywhere and competes for space with the great herbivores. In this war, we know who will always be the loser. In no time, meat was not enough. We wanted it all. Ivory for the office of a selfish ape. Mankind has crowned itself the king of creation. Its extraordinary cultural and technological evolution have enabled it to rule the planet and all its creatures. In the 21st century, the overpopulation of the planet, which will soon reach 7 billion people, as well as a climate change caused by our out-of-control thirst for energy consumption, pose serious threats to the supposed success of those who call themselves 
Sapiens Sapiens. The most powerful ethnicity born in the new age of communication and globalization is the tribe of the suit. If an extraterrestrial observer studied us from a zoological standpoint, just as we do with all other animals, what conclusions would it draw from our behavior? Isn't it true that many of our actions are frankly stupid and unintelligent? If we weigh our successes against their consequences, are we truly an evolutionary success? The worst of it is that we do so knowingly. No member of the tribe of the suit can allege in their defense that they do not know what we are doing to our own future as a species. The chaos in which we live is a sum of egotisms that do not make us happier. It might be that the price of success is too expensive. We equate wealth and power with massive consumption. Only we are capable of eating without being hungry, drinking without being thirsty, and exterminating other animals only to wear their skins. The great herds we used to venerate as if they were gods are now just an obstacle in our way. In the world, there are more poor and chronically underfed people than there were in the beginning of the 20th century. Radical and religious groups kill each other at a never-before-seen scale, and nuclear arsenals hold enough weaponry to permanently finish off the human species. We were an impressive, beautiful animal before all this began. The enormous variety of cultures that used to exist on Earth, of tribes and of human ethnicities, are as such being exterminated. The number of autonomous ethnic groups in the world reached its zenith in the year 1000 before Christ. At that time, there were some 500,000 different tribes. Today, there are fewer than 200. Experts figure that in the year 2300, there will be only one state. Millions of traditions and of cultural learnings linked to the different landscapes of the planet have disappeared before the single uniform current of thought that passes over them like an inexorable steamroller. The rights of the tribe of the suit spread throughout the planet like a plague annihilating other cultures. They don't care about religion, races, or creeds. Their only god is economic success. 
The tribe of the suit is all of us and no one. The long existence as fruit eaters has taken them to a very different jungle in which they can no longer drink from puddles. Here, herds of steam horses roar and darkness is an illusion. These places are better fit for insects than for primates. For the last 25,000 years, our bodies and our minds have been one and the same. We got here biologically through natural selection, a rather slow but persistent engine that is difficult to change without help from the millennia. However, there is yet another force that is causing a great conflict for us, cultural evolution. This changes quite fast, too fast. It places the habits of an internet surfer in a body that is not so different from that of a chimpanzee. Having reached this point, there can be no doubt that we are truly a very strange primate. Long legs, strange feet, but the most striking physical characteristic of our body is the lack of body hair. We are a naked monkey. It's something unique among primates and very infrequent even among mammals. Of over 4,000 species of living mammals, only a handful lacks any hair on their bodies. This is because mammals' fur was one of the great physiological advantages that allowed them to blossom. It protects them from the sun and the heat, preserves them from the cold, and reinforces the skin. The other mammals that lost their fur like us did so mainly because they changed their land-based medium for another. Bats, for example, bared their wings in order to fly. They're the only mammals that have conquered airspace. Diggers like the armadillo lost their coat because it is unnecessary for underground living. And aquatic mammals did it to adapt to water. Others, like the rhinoceros and the elephant, became there because of the particular problems their large size posed in warming up or cooling down. But we don't fly like bats, nor do we bury ourselves like armadillos, nor are we as big as elephants. So if we lost our fur, there must have been a powerful reason. But which? Something must have happened during our evolution. In order to explain this, scientists have expounded a variety of hypotheses. One of them is that certain immature features of primates were conserved and prolonged in humans during our adult lives. It's as if we were born and remained physically premature without completing our physical development 
thus remaining in a previous fetal stage without barely any hair on our bodies, like this newborn orangutan. Evolution favored the development of the brain, turning the hunting ape into an infantile ape. Upon birth, our brain is only 23% of its adult size. Its growth continues for up to 10 years after we reach sexual maturity, and it isn't fully developed until approximately the age of 24. The brain of a young chimpanzee, on the other hand, reaches its full growth at its first year of age. Therefore, a lack of body hair and an underdeveloped brain are infantile features. Other characteristics that could come from this so-called neoteny are our long, fine neck, different from that of other primates. The position of the cranium at a right angle, a flat face, small and late emerging teeth, and the big toe, which has not moved to the side as it has in the great apes. All of these would be embryonic immature characteristics that are common to the fetus of a primate and that we might have conserved in our adult age in order to survive. But the most attractive theory is undoubtedly the one that explains that we had an evolutionary past closely linked to water. In other words, that we were once practically a marine mammal. Known as the Homo aquaticus theory, it sustains that our lineage, before becoming hunters, went through a long phase as a semi-aquatic ape. According to this theory, our ancestors moved to tropical beaches in search of food. This is an ecosystem rich in animal protein and one in which it is relatively easy to obtain them. In the beginning, we searched for seafood and coastal animals in line with the tide, within the sand and the beach rocks. But little by little, we spent more time inside the water, learning to swim and to dive. It was then when, according to this theory, we lost our body hair, like dolphins, keeping it only on our heads, the only part of the body that remained outside the water and exposed to the sun. The shores of these seas warm and full of protein, might have had another positive effect on our cerebral development. Searching in those depths, our ancestors could have realized that the shells of mollusks were sharp and could be used as tools. The Homo aquaticus theory finds evidence in a few morphological characteristics of our current body. Such as our great skill at swimming underwater. This is really extraordinary among primates, most of which can't swim at all. We like water. We truly enjoy it. 
We're willing to invest a great deal of time, effort, and money to experience its invigorating caress. Our idea of happiness and luxury has always been linked to a bath. The members of the tribe of the suit often journey in their cars for hundreds of kilometers whenever they can, just to immerse themselves in water for even a few minutes. There is something ancestral in this habit of ours that is so different from the rest of the primates. we members of the tribe owe water more than we believe. Our bodies have a few interesting characteristics that fit in with this hypothesis, such as the layer of fat under our skin, which we share with cetaceans and seals, and which the rest of the primates lack. Our nose, long and different from other primates, works like the keel of a boat. It prevents water from entering as we advance. It's a perfect valve that closes the orifices, making water flow on either side. Our closest genetic kin, which do not float at all and hate water, have completely different noses. except one. There is a primate in Borneo that doesn't mind swimming, and its most striking feature is the one that lends it its name. The proboscis monkey has a nose that makes it look suspiciously like us. We both swim. We both have noses different from the rest of our primate cousins. Natural selection doesn't produce something like this for no reason. The defenders of the Homo aquaticus theory say that this also explains a few of our other anatomical peculiarities, such as the elongated shape of our body, the vertical posture we walk in, or the voluntary control of our breathing, more common to dolphins than to primates. What is evident in all cultures is that from the moment we are born, water makes us happy. Even our valuable hands, especially sensitive compared to those of great apes, have evolved according to this theory to feel for food underwater. To capture invertebrates in a medium in which the sense of touch is indispensable. But this attractive hypothesis of our origins has been disqualified by science because fossil remains have never been found to prove it. Its defenders have a very logical explanation for this. 
No one searches for fossils under the sea in what were the coasts of Africa a million years ago. Wherever it may have been, what we are today, we owe to evolution in a specific medium. Not only physically, but in our day-to-day -day behavior as well. It's not easy to do without ancestral simian impulses that have been part of us for millions of years. Facing our animal side might make us better, but this seems difficult for us to do. We want to get close to God by denying our relationship with animals. The tribe of the suit attributes human dignity to the fact that we are outside of nature and that we are singular with respect to all other animals, but we differ in only 1.23% of our genes from our closest relative. We try to define ourselves as alien to them at any cost. We want to differentiate ourselves. We look for that characteristic that distinguishes us from the rest, but we can't seem to find it. Our common ancestor lived only six million years ago, a very short time span in evolutionary terms, barely a sigh. First, it was said that we were the only ones to communicate in a complex language. But this wasn't true. In the 1960s, Roger Payne discovered that cetaceans also do so. Then this distinguishing feature was searched for in the idea that only we built and used tools. But Jane Goodall refuted this by observing large primates. Some, like this gorilla, are even capable of building and using a musical instrument. And finally, it was believed that only we were capable of having a culture. But it has been shown that other animals also have one. Biology teaches us humility with each discovery. These orcas from the Valdez Peninsula in the Argentine Patagonia are capable of inventing new behavior patterns and actively teaching them to their offspring. The adults are training the young orcas to reach into coastal sands in order to capture the offspring of Patagonian sea lions that bathe in shallow waters. This is culture, to discover something different that no orca has ever done before and deliberately transmit that to their descendants. Therefore, the orca has culture just like we do. To claim other animals and primates as part of us isn't taking a step back. On the contrary, it means embracing our origins without shame. To see what we are, we just have to observe ourselves closely. Never before have we known so much. This is the first generation that is completely aware of what we're doing. There are many behavior patterns in the tribe of the suit that seem inevitable. One of them is our blinding obsession with hierarchy and social prestige. Because we developed as a hunting ape in reduced communities of around 100 members, it seems that the problem began when we went on to live in large cities 
surrounded by thousands of unknown fellow human beings, where primitive hunting expeditions became expeditions to go to work. What's more, male groups mix with female groups in companies. All of these are experiences for which we were not designed. In reduced primate groups, it seems easy for the dominating hierarchy to find its place and establish itself. But in a massive urban community, the situation is much more strained. Every day, the selfish ape is exposed to unwanted encounters with countless strangers. An unprecedented situation for any other primate species. It isn't possible to engage in a social hierarchy with all of them, which is why we use the so-called anti-contact bylaws that allow us to go through life without dominating or being dominated and clearly establishing who we are. We do so without realizing it, but it requires a great deal of effort on our part. There is an excess of stimulus. This is why we avoid eye contact, pointing and establishing direct body contact. This is why greeting practices have been ritualized. The handshake was adopted to enable slight contact while keeping a proper distance. Its origin seems to be this. Napoleon, this male dominant chimp, is quite nervous. To calm him, one of the females places her hand near the male's mouth. Bite me if you want to is what this gesture means. This calms him, as it is an example of submission, a friendly greeting, just like ours. The kiss on the cheek also comes from the primate act of sniffing each other in order to obtain information about a possible mate. We have rendered it devoid of all sexual content but we still do it in many parts of the world. But even when we were able to build dangerous weapons, we had to also develop so-called appeasement signals in order to create friendly links within the group. One of the most common signs of appeasement among our cousins involves a secondary individual cleaning and ridding a dominant of parasites in order to gain favor or protection, removing parasites from places he cannot reach with his own hands. We started out doing exactly the same thing, but the ritual became ever more complicated. And because in a city we can't rid our boss of parasites in order to get a raise, we had to invent a substitute mechanism. What biologists call an invitation to social cleaning is what allows the weak animal to be present near the dominant one. He is allowed to stay thanks to the service he provides. It started out as an invitation through a click of the lips like chimps do. And scientists believe that in us, it first became what we call smiling and later evolved into language. The language of courtesy, that trivial banter over unimportant issues that does not inform us about anything nor transmits any real feeling, is the human version of the social cleaning of the rest of the primates. It only has one end, to gain favor and be accepted. One exception to this language of courtesy is the business meeting, in order to maximize time and not waste it in unnecessary social cleanings, formalities are exaggerated. Here, everyone already knows the hierarchy. Everyone knows who's the boss. It's not necessary to clean him. This verbal cleaning appears only briefly during the greeting and the farewell. Many of our most everyday gestures also have rather unsuspected origins. Any angry ape will try to intimidate others in its group by making its hair stand on end 
to seem larger and more menacing. We do the same thing, placing something on our head that will make us seem larger to the person before us. Male gorillas have an oversized crest to impress their rivals. Our military and police uniforms are based on the same principle. Tall headwear and shoulder pads make us fierce. All of this for the same reason. The selfish ape of the tribe of the suit must maintain its place in society and, if possible, improve it. But they must do it cautiously without jeopardizing their cooperative contacts, because we need to feel that we belong to a group that will protect us. This is where the system of signs of submission and of aggression or dominance come into play. Group collaboration requires a high degree of uniformity, both in terms of clothes and of behavior, but there is still a large margin for hierarchic competition. The suit and tie, our symbol, is the best example. Its presence or absence sends us messages. It must be present in business situations, but it could be of a brand name, or colored, loud, or serious, fashionable, or a classic. In social encounters, all of the selfish ape's fears are laid bare. It's easy to tell who the dominant individual is in a meeting just by observing them. They're the ones who don't eat, nor drink, nor scratch themselves, nor do anything compulsively. They're at ease. They make eye contact. They're the alpha male or female, and they know it. Everyone knows it. We're hungry for prestige. We're a tribe of competitive status seekers. We spend our whole life trying to climb the social ladder simply to impress others. The important thing is to not be less than our neighbors. This makes us permanently unsatisfied a condition that could be the key to our foreseeable and dark end as a species. We compete amongst ourselves, but who really wins? Nobel Prize winner Conrad Lorenz said that human civilization increasingly foments what he called the degenerative types. Is it possible that the tribe of the suit is favoring the failure of the best over the mediocre? Many scientists assure this, there is a strong tendency to try to destroy anyone who stands out. When a true genius arrives in our midst, he or she can be recognized because of one common behavior pattern. All mediocre members conspire against them. Dr. Gonzalez de Rivera has described this as AIM, Active Inoperative Mediocrity Syndrome, people whose objective it is to annihilate the advance of a brilliant person. If it's true that this is happening, everything makes sense. The tribe of the suit has inverted the natural order of things, changing natural selection, which prized the most prepared, for social selection, which gives power to the worst. We're out of control as a species. Maybe it'd be best to just let the planet go on without me. Or maybe I might be able to change. That's only a matter of time. A very little time. <laughs> 